folks, and welcome to our February TMN Tuesday event. Um, we're excited to have a lot of y'all on with us today, and we have a really exciting speaker who's got a lot of really great information. I'm going to let Michelle introduce our speaker when we get to that point. Um, but before we do, we always like to run through a little bit of text so that we make sure, so that we know that you can hear us. You can see my mouth moving, and hopefully you can see the screen, and hopefully you can hear us as well. Um, if this is your first TMN Tuesday, welcome. Um, do not worry, as a TMN Tuesday participant, you cannot unmute or share your video, but that is on purpose. Uh, a lot of times we have up to a thousand participants, um, and, and we're, we're going to get pretty close to that today. So we're excited to have so many folks um, joining us for our, our webinar this month. Um, again, if this is your first TMN Tuesday webinar, we do use our chat as our function to be able to communicate with our panelists, our speakers, our, the other attendees, um, and so you'll want to make sure that you're using that chat button. But before you do, and you can't hear, if you can't hear me telling you that we're going to use the chat, um, you need to check out your audio settings. So those audio settings are in your settings uh, panel on your WebEx. You're going to want to make sure that your volume is turned on, your speakers are plugged in, um, and that you have the correct speaker selected uh, as well. And then here's the chat. So for our chat today, we uh, are going to ask for all on-topic discussion uh, using professional and respectful sentences and full and clear sentences as well. Um, try to avoid acronyms and, and use the best spelling you can. So Michelle and I, as uh, chat moderators can help to ask the questions that you're intending to be asked. Um, final little bit of tech help here. We have a, a help call center if you're still having issues with WebEx and a an FAQ website as well. All right, before we jump into the topic, our final run through of our TMN Tuesday webinar etiquette as always. Um, attendees are not able to unmute during the WebEx event. Please use the chat box to, uh, to chat with us. It is open for on-topic discussion. Please be respectful and professional with all comments and questions. Um, the session is going to run a little longer than an hour, and Michelle might talk about that here in just a little bit, but please stick with us. We are recording today's webinar. If you are not able to stay the full hour, um, that's okay. We're going to have the recording on the website by later this afternoon, if not first thing tomorrow morning. Um, and watching the TMN Tuesday either live or as a recording can count for advanced training if you are a Texas Master Naturalist. Again, if you're still having issues with WebEx, um, we do have more resources on our website as well. All right, with that, Michelle, you want to kick off and uh, introduce our topic for the month, a little bit about the program, and then our fantastic speaker. Yeah, we have a great presentation for you for February. Um, as you know, our if you're a Master Naturalist already in the program, you know that our 2023 annual recertification pin uh, this year is the image of our natural reg regions of Texas. Um, and actually, I can show you, it's like the, the picture on my wall back there. Um, that is what our 2023 um, recertification pin is this year. It's also our 25th anniversary for the Master Naturalist Program. So what better um, representation for the 25th anniversary than all of our ecoregions of Texas? Um, our our Present presentation today will cover all of the ecoregions of Texas. Um, Laura Mick, Mitch um, is, and I'm sorry if I didn't pronounce that correctly, Laura. Um, Laura will be our expert today talking about the ecoregions of Texas. Um, and more specifically, her title for today's topic is called Landscape Diversity is Bigger in Texas, Exploring the Ecoregions of Texas and How Are They How They Are Mapped. Go to the next slide. So if you're um, new to the Master Naturalist program, you're not yet a member, um, just a reminder, again, we've mentioned it already in this webinar, um, these webinars, the TMN Tuesday events are offered as advanced training for our Texas Master Naturalist. Um, in ma our Master Naturalists can watch them either live or recorded within the year that they are recorded. 
and receive advanced training credit for them. We did mention earlier that uh, today's presentation is expected to be a little bit longer than an hour. Um, and then questions after that. So, um, as I mentioned, that we offer our TMN Tuesdays every month. Um, it's the second Tuesday of every month. Uh, within within reason, there are some exceptions to the year, um, which we've noted. You'll see on this um, screen here um, some exceptions that um, we have floating for our TMN Tuesdays to be some crossover events and some special events. So. Um, again, they're always free, always open to the public, um, geared towards our master naturalists and the topics that we encounter as Texas master naturalists and um, offered as advanced training to help better our volunteer service in these areas. Um, all of our trainings are, all of our team and Tuesdays are recorded. They're offered on our website uh, after the event. Um, and you have the link there shown, and we'll also be dropping it in the chat for you too. Next slide. Um, related to our TMN Tuesday events, we want to put a plug for our virtual volunteer fair um, that is happening May 2nd and 3rd. So save the date. We'll have more information on our virtual volunteer fair coming up soon. Um, and we kind of put this in here because uh, some of the information that Laura is presenting today, um, many of our master naturalists have been involved in the TPWD team tool, um, which has been a ground truthing tool for uh, the agency and uh, the tools that Laura and her team have been using. So some of our master naturalists have been involved in that as a virtual service project. Um, so a plug for the virtual volunteer fair coming up. Uh, again, this year, May 2nd and 3rd. And then uh, back to our speaker, Laura Mitch, with, is a botanist with our Texas Parks and Wildlife Department um, in, within our ecology program. Her work experience has been guided by seasoned ecologists and botanists in the field and in the laboratory. She has experience in invasive species and envir environmental restoration both. Laura is passionate about the application application of, sus of sustainability and biology in all fields. During her time at the University of Texas, she conducted independent research concerning the impact of botany education on consumer perception and participation in sustainable food systems. Laura has an extensive knowledge about plant care, ecology, plant identification, and sustainable agriculture. So quite simply, she's one of you, one of us, has the same interests. Um, at TPWD, Laura works with our team to incorporate geospatial projects, integrating ecological principles, field data collection, advanced GIS technology, remote sensing, and uh, user-friendly app development for landscape management and conservation planning, uh, which I mentioned includes our TPWD team tool. So um, without further introduction, I'm going to turn it over to Laura and get us started today. And just a note, um, as Laura's getting her presentation pulled up, we're going to hold all questions. Um, so go ahead and chat questions for Laura on the topic being presented today in the, the text chat. And we're going to hold all questions um, at the end. And just a reminder that I know we know that today may go right at that hour or a little bit over. And so if we cannot get to all the questions today, um, we may have some follow up um, kind of electronically um, through a FAQ sheet that's put up on our website after the event. Okay, Laura, take it away. Awesome. Thank you for that introduction. I'm super excited to get to talk to you guys today about um, the different ecoregions of Texas. We have a lot to go over. I'm going to try to keep it within an hour slightly over, but no promises. So the title of this, as, spoke, as said earlier, is Landscape Diversity is Bigger in Texas. We're going to be exploring the ecoregions and a general overview of what we're going to be going over. We're going to start off by talking about what are ecoregions, doing a general view, review of their purpose, how they're made, how they change over time. And then we're going to look at the various ecoregion maps that exist and just kind of give an explanation why. It's kind of confusing. If you do your own personal research into ecoregions, you're going to come across a lot of different maps. 
Then we're going to talk about the ecological mapping systems, which is what our program uh, at Texas Parks and Wild at Texas Parks and Wildlife, the landscape ecology program works on. And then I'm going to explain how EMS and ecoregions are connected are connected. Then we're going to move into what everybody is excited to hear about today, the different ecoregions of Texas. For each ecoregion, we're going to discuss the ecoregion's climate, topography, soil, vegetation, different EMS examples that are existing within that ecoregion, the exports of the region, and species of greatest conservation need, or SGCN. And we're just going to be going over a few of them, not all of them. And then at the end, I'm going to post a resource for the team app that uh, Michelle was speaking about. It is a really cool resource, and there are a lot of trainings on it that my coworkers have conducted. So some of you might already know what it is. So this is the map that we're going to be using today. Like I previously said, there are a lot of ecoregion maps out there. We chose the Omernick ecoregion map, and this is the level three ecoregion map, and we'll explain what that means later. We chose this map with the Landscape Ecology Program because it's the most accurate and it has the most current information uh, used, and it's redrawn frequently. Also, it's the map, the ecoregion map used in the State Wildlife Action Plan, which is how we get our federal funding for our projects. So let's get some stuff straight. There is a lot of jargon when it comes to ecoregions, and I think having a baseline understanding of what they are is very important before we get into it. So ecoregions very basically map the Earth's surface subdivided into identifiable areas based on macro scale patterns of ecosystems. What does that mean? More specifically, ecoregions show where biotic and abiotic components like geology, landforms, soils, vegetation, climate, land use, wildlife, and hydrology are similar. And the relative, import, relative importance of each of these factors varies from ecoregion to ecoregion. So one ecoregion could prioritize their soil data when drawing their boundaries, while another might think that land use commonalities are more important when deciding what's a part of an ecoregion and what's not. Why do ecoregions exist? Why do we possibly need another map? We have plenty. And each, you know, like I said, there are multiple maps, but the purpose varies from map to map, which we will go over more in the next slide. But different creators of different maps have different purposes for their map, depending on who they're making the map for, right? Um, but commonly, it seems like all of the maps serve as a spatial framework for research, management, and monitoring of ecosystem and ecosystem components. They give a level of organization to a landscape and a spatial reference for people working there. So a com an example that I think ties into this well is if you're going somewhere in the United States and say New York, and they say, where are you from? You say Texas. Telling them that you're from Texas gives them some information about where you're from and what that looks like. Having labels on things is very helpful for communication. And grouping areas into ecoregions provides structure for implementing unified ecosystem management strategies across different government agencies and private groups. So someone working in the Nature Conservancy can talk to somebody who works in the same ecoregion at Texas Parks and Wildlife, and they can have a more common understanding of their landscape because they're within the same ecoregion. And I think another really important thing to discuss is how, or you know what, I'm actually jumping ahead. Let's talk about how uh, ecoregions are mapped. There is, who are they mapped by is uh, there's no single answer to that. Like I said, there are multiple maps with different creators and the different groups use different, uh, I, I have never made an ecoregion map, so I won't even begin to understand the, the math and the data that goes behind that, but different, very generally people will weigh different factors more. Uh, for the Omernick map, which is the one that we're going to be using today, it was mapped as a collaboration with EPA regional offices, other federal agencies, state resource management agencies, and neighboring North American countries. 
And I think it's important to note that drawing ecoregions is an imperfect science. Within a defined ecoregion, there is spatial correlation among the different characteristics, but they are not absolute. So, you know, things often operate on a gradient. They don't, they don't exist in black and white values. Environmental condi conditions change gradually, making the exact boundaries of an ecoregion hard to draw, which is why these maps will start looking very different. Not to mention the changing climate will influence these characteristics over time. And a whole nother uh, thing that I'll briefly touch on is that certain maps will be more detailed than others. So I think I specified earlier that we're using the, eco the Omernic ecoregion map on level three. There's a whole other level, level four, which has, that splits ecoregions up into subregions. So certain <laughs> ecoregion maps will uh, be more or less detailed depending on what you're looking at. And this was the topic that I was talking about, going to skip to earlier. Um, I think it's really important to discuss how ecoregions are shifting with environmental changes currently going on, and that is being considered by map creators. Many maps have been updated as more data becomes available and landscapes change. Ecoregion creators acknowledge the shortcomings of trying to map natural phenomenon that are highly affected by climate change and time. But that being said, do exude caution when you're working around the edges of an ecoregion for multiple reasons. First off, like we were discussing earlier, nature is not static, and it is very, it is very reasonable that characteristics of ecoregions will kind of ooze into each other. They're they are remapped, but not as frequently as they should be because time and money are limiting. For example, with our EMS map, we are just now remapping it and the original map came out in 2014 and you guys all just reflect on how much Texas has changed since 2014, right? All right, so here's a few different maps just to kind of uh, illustrate the idea I was speaking about earlier with maps ending up looking different depending on who makes it, why they make it, and the method used for making it. The intended purpose of ecoregion map and differing method affects the way the final map looks. Some people who have made maps include the EPA, the Sierra Club, the Nature Conservancy, and many others. And just because these maps look different and people weigh certain factors more or less, it doesn't make one ecoregion map right or wrong. They're just suited for a different purpose, right? So moving from left to right, looking at these maps on um, the screen, I am going to give the background behind them. And you can kind of process the background versus what they look like and compare them with one another as I go through them. So the first map to the left is the Bailey ecoregion map, which was developed by R.G. Bailey from the USDA Forest Service and based on conditions in 1994. Since he worked for the USDA Forest Service, the, for, the purpose of this ecoregion map was based on forestry objectives and also Bailey wanted there to be greater coordination between natural resource groups. For methodology, Bailey believed ecoregions should be drawn with more emphasis on abiotic characteristics, especially climate, because he believed they were more stable. Then we have the Omernick map, which is the one that our presentation is based on today. It was created by James M. Omernick with the EPA Environmental Research Laboratory, and it was revised over time, and I think I'm pretty sure the most recent revision was in 2013. Similar to what we discussed, Omernick believed the ecoregion framework could allow groups to set common resource management goals and implement environmental managed common environmental management strategies across different agencies and groups. For methodology, Omernick believed that there should be emphasis placed on abiotic and biotic characteristics, so a bit different than the Bailey map. Then we have the natural regions map of Texas, and this is the one that the TMN uh, certification pin is based on. It was created by a team of scientists and laymen in 1978. They distinguished ecoregions by physiographic, which is like landforms, and biologic differences. The goal of their uh, natural regions map was to serve as a point of reference for all Texans and also to help locate areas in Texas that were ecologically significant or unique 
um, and, and uh, target those for preservation. Different ecoregion map scientists were referenced in their works, and this map is more Texas focused than the rest of the maps. And there is no emphasis on climate, from what I understand, when this natural regions map was drawn. So also very different from the other maps. Then we have the World Wildlife Fund ecoregion map. This placed greater emphasis on floral and faunal differences that rather than abiotic factors. And this uh, map was created to aid in conservation and also aimed at being useful on a larger, larger scale. So global conservation rather than local or state uh, organ, uh, conservation. Similar to the other regions, Ecoregions are sim, sim, <laughs> sorry, similar to the other ecoregion maps. The World Wildlife Fund ecoregion map was intended to be a unit for conservation action. So we have a common uh, trend of all of these maps being used for conservation efforts, but one map has emphasis on biotic characteristics more, and one map has greater emphasis on climate and different purposes, and you can see how that generates a slightly different looking map. They all have similar trends between them. You can kind of compare one ecoregion to another and understand where you are, but they do look different. So now we're gonna start talking about the ecological mapping systems map that our landscape ecology program has created. And very simply put, this ecoregion map, or not ecoregion map, this EMS map is a map to describe in more detail the vegetation of the ecoregions. So ecological mapping systems, what are they? This map was created in 2014 and I will refer to it as our EMS map and it's our statewide vegetation data set. Whenever we mapped it, there was 403 vegetation types across the state and it yeah 400 and uh sorry 402 my apologies 402 vegetation types across the state and 10 meter resolution geospatial format within those 402 vegetation types uh, there were 19 invasive uh, vegetation or habitat, habitat types maps. So think about, you know, mesquite shrublands that are in places that they wouldn't normally be. This data set was developed by aerial imagery, ground truthing points. In fact, we had over 22,000 ground truthing points and abiotic information like elevation, slope, and soils. And the accuracy of the map is 74 to 90%, which is pretty good. So I wanted to put these maps side by side so you could kind of look at them and start processing what their connections might be. Basically put, like I said earlier, the AMS map is a higher resolution vegetation map of the ecoregions of Texas. So I made this little chart, this little flow chart to kind of break down how we get from ecoregion to EMS or mapping target subsystem. So when you move from ecoregion to ecological system, we take a finer resolution look at uh, the vegetation in the area. And we look at the abiotic factors still, but within a smaller unit of land. So ecoregions are these giant mass of landforms and ecological systems are kind of zooming in and looking at smaller areas and emphasizing vegetation. When you move from ecological system to mapping target subsystem or our EMS types, we'll take a finer resolution look at the land, even more finer resolution. Um, ecological system components are then split up by what land cover type they're a part of. Land cover types are basic general types of vegetation, like broadleaf evergreen forest, which would be like a yopon dominated forest grasslands, deciduous shrublands, etc. This will make more sense in the next slide. So what ecoregion a vegetation community is in is one of the several factors taken into consideration when categorizing a chunk of land into a specific EMS type. Just like how we described how ecoregions are drawn using different factors, EMS vegetation communities 
communities are delineated and categorized for smaller areas of land and based on different factors, including the ecoregion. So an Edwards Plateau vegetation type cannot occur if that plot of land is in the Blackland Prairie, for example. Here is a very, very uh, straightforward example of what I'm talking about. So this is, a, I wanted to note that this is a limited example that does not include all of the ecological systems within that ecoregion or all of the EMS types within that ecological system. So we start with the ecoregion. We're in the Edwards Plateau and we move into the vegetation communities that are located in areas with certain characteristics. So let's go through this top kind of set of boxes. So we're in the Edwards Plateau, and then we're in vegetation systems that are on plateau tops and gentle slopes with certain soil types. We're looking at a zoomed in version of the Edwards Plateau type and looking at these specific characteristics. We know that we're in an ecological system called the Edwards Plateau limestone savanna and woodland. And this will comprise many different vegetation types. This will comprise forest, grasslands, shrublands, all of that. So to break that up into their EMS types, we look at what land cover types, smaller units of land are. And this can be gathered through remote sensing. So looking at satellite imagery. So we're in the Edwards Plateau, limestone, savanna, and woodland. And we are among broadleaf evergreen forest land cover types. We know that the EMS type will then be an Edwards Plateau, live oak, mott, and woodland. And so going back, we're in the Edwards Plateau, limestone, savanna, and woodland, and we are in a deciduous forest. That deciduous forest would be a Edwards Plateau, post oak, mott, and woodland. You can kind of understand. So vegetation that falls in those areas and falls under an ecological system, which contains a parent description for several and even more refined EMS types within. I hope that that makes sense. You guys don't really need to understand this all the time, all the way, but I wanted to kind of connect the topics of ecoregions and EMS types. All right, so let's start going through the different ecoregions. And we're gonna start, the way I organize this is kind of moving from the east coast to the west, Texas. So, and then moving kind of north to south within that. We're gonna start in the South Central Plains, also known as the Piney Woods. This is the Southern extension of the rich pine and hardwood forests of the Southeastern United States. To kind of put you guys there, I have some awesome images. And this area was once blanketed with a mix of pine and hardwood, and now the region is pretty much covered with pine plantations dominated by loblolly and shortleaf pine. About two thirds of the region is forests and woodlands and one sixth is cropland, which mostly exists in the Red River floodplain. Let's start with the abiotic characteristics of the Piney Woods regions. And when you look at, I made these precipitation maps for each of the eco regions and as you can see darker colors will show higher precipitation and lighter colors will show lower precipitation i know that legend is kind of small um, this region has pretty high precipitation in comparison to the rest of texas average annual rainfall is 36 to 50 inches throughout the year humidity and temperature are high Average temperatures range from 48.36 degrees Fahrenheit to 82.57 degrees Fahrenheit. The topography of the area is rolling terrains and elevations that range from 200 to 500 feet above sea level, which explains the humidity. Uh, soils are very generally acidic and mostly pale to dark gray sands or sandy loams. So, for the vegetation of this area, the way I've broken it up is to give a general idea of what the ecoregion looks like and then uh, explain what are common EMS types in the region and what are unique EMS types in the region. And this is biased because it's the ones that I think are interesting and cool. So sorry, sorry if you don't think the ones that I think are cool are cool. Um, 
So the ecoregion vegetation is generally characterized by pines and hardwood trees. And um, as we said earlier, it's the southern extension of the pine and hardwood forests of the southeastern United States. So we get a little taste of that. Um, a common EMS type, one, one of the most common EMS types in the area are the piney woods, pine forest, or plantation. This is an upland system that forms a matrix over a large portion of the coastal plain. It occupies different, way, many different soil types and topographic conditions. So you can find this pine forest or plantation type on um, hilltops, ridges, slopes, and lo lower landscape positions where conditions are even more moisture rich. The species composition of this system varies across these gradients, but Typically, loblolly pine will dominate the canopy, and, and unfortunately, there used to be way more diversity in the canopy of this forest system. But uh, with logging and uh, the lumber industry in the area, shortleaf pine, or sorry, loblolly pine became very commonly planted, but shortleaf pine and longleaf pine used to be present at greater capacities. Uh, many sites mapped also as pine forests are actually managed pine plantations and managed forests, which is an issue with our EMS map that hopefully with the remap, we will figure out how to change. So you'll know what's a natural landscape and what's a man-made forest. Um, another common EMS type moving on is the pine and hardwood forest or plantation EMS type. This EMS type in contrast to the pine forest and plantation is not found on hills and ridge tops. Uh, so it's a little less common than the pine forest EMS type. This forest has a canopy that is mixed with evergreen and deciduous trees. And this EMS type is typically part of a managed forest as well with loblolly and hardwood species like sweet gum, black hickory, water oak, water oak and others. Uh, another common EMS type is the small stream and riparian temporarily flooded mixed forest. That's a mouthful. <laughs> this occupies the bottomlands of small rivers, streams, and creeks. It has a canopy made up of mostly hardwood species like winged elm, sweet gum, sugar hackberry, and other evergreen species like eastern red cedar and loblolly pine at lesser degrees. Now, the cool EMS types, the unique EMS types. Uh, one cool EMS type is the seepage, swamp, and bagel EMS type. This is found in lower points of the landscape along low gradient creeks, headwaters of drainages or local depressions, so more moisture rich areas, and can be often found where underground water flow exits the surface as a seep. These areas are typically semi-permanently saturated. The system is densely wooded with overstory species like sweet bay, swamp tupelo, and red maple. This system is unfortunately not super well mapped because it takes such, or it's present in such small areas, which is hard for us to map. And also it's under a canopy. So when using satellite imagery, it's really hard to see where these exist, but hopefully with higher resolution imagery, we'll be able able to do a better job of mapping this EMS type. And another really cool EMS type is the near coast bald cypress swamp, which is just beautiful. I love the, the weepy looking uh, moss, it's just gorgeous. This is found in large river floodplains of the Sabine, Neches, and Trinity rivers near the coast. It's dominated obviously by bald cypress, and also water tupelo, and this occurs along rivers when they enter, as they enter bays and estuaries. These swamps are typically interspersed with marshes uh, of the coastal region. So it's a very wet, lots of mosquitoes. I think you all can feel what it must feel like to be in a bald cypress swamp. <laughs> So now this is kind of the page where I couldn't really group these things into a, a clever category and I just call it miscellaneous characteristics. 
I thought it was important to talk about the land use and exports of each region because they have such a huge impact on nature and what the habitat looks like. So, as kind of previously discussed, timber and cattle production are the most important industries of the region. It has smaller farmland than the rest of the state, but timber uh, timber production is definitely probably the biggest impact on the habitat types. Um, and some exciting and fun species of greatest conservation need include um, Amorpha paniculata, which is the panicled indigo brush. It's found in wetlands and salt prairies in the Piney Woods region, which is a rare EMS type. Uh, the species is threatened by herbicide springs, fire suppression, and non-native species encroachment. And can anyone guess which is a very particularly problematic non-native species that is endangering this uh, this plant? Okay, Chinese tallow. Yeah, big surprise, big surprise. Um, Another cool uh, species of graze conservation need is Somo tochlora margarita, which is the Texas emerald dragonfly. Uh, the optimal habitat type for the Texas emerald dragonfly is spring-fed creeks and bogs, and the dragonfly is tied to rare pitcher plants as well. I don't know if anybody's been to the Big Thicket uh, Park, but there is a really cool boardwalk there that has a bunch of pitcher plants. It's very cool to see. The biggest threat to this species is uh, habitat fragmentation and degradation due to oil and gas extraction, agriculture, pine plantations, and logging. Another threat comes from su fire suppression leading to increased undergrowth that affects water and stream flow. So it kind of transforms these stream habitats that the emerald dragonfly uh, thrives in into just woody messes. <laughs> All right, moving into the next ecoregion. This is the Western Gulf Coast Plain. Um, this is a flat strip of land that is about 50 to 90 miles wide along the Gulf Coast of Texas. And just to put you guys here, we have some awesome, beautiful pictures of the coast. Uh, a distinguishing characteristic of this ecoregion is its flat topography. The most common land cover type is grasslands. Inland from the coast, there are older and more irregular plains covered by forests and savanna type vegetation. And unfortunately, a large portion of this area is now cropland. But there's some really pretty pictures up here. The pictures on the right are actually from Powderhorn Ranch, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard is the new uh, state park that will be opening in several years, but very excited to go. Uh, so we'll start off with discussing the abiotic characteristics of the Western Gulf Coast Plains. As you can see from the precipitation map, there is a lot of variation in um, precipitation levels throughout the region. Average annual rainfall is 30 to 50 inches and is uniform throughout the year. There is slight variation down the coast, like I said, and the temperatures range from 55.3 degrees Fahrenheit to 83.4 degrees Fahrenheit. And as I discussed earlier, the topography is pretty flat and it is slowly draining. Elevations stay under 150 feet above sea level and there are rich, or there, sorry, the area is rich with hydrologic features. Soils in the area are acidic sands and sandy loams with clays occurring in uh, river bottoms. So for the vegetation in the area, there's a lot of variation, including salt marshes, estuaries, tall grass prairies, oak mods, you name it, the Gulf Coast Plains has it. Some common, plant, some common plants include southern live oak, lots of different hardwood species, Indian blanket, lemon bee balm, and a lot of other wildflowers. It is really a, it's really a diverse plant area in regions where or in areas of that region where there isn't a ton of agriculture. And tying into that, the most common EMS type in that region is row crops or agriculture. I didn't want to show this because it's not as fun as other EMS types, but I think it's too important to leave out because of the loss of coastal prairie habitat. Another common EMS type is the Texas Louisiana coastal prairie. And I have a little asterisk by this to discuss that there is, it is mapped the way it is 
and it shows like there's a lot of coastal prairie, but there's a lot of variation in the quality. And when we map this EMS type, there wasn't a great way of distinguishing that variation. So the landscape ecology team is currently working on a project to differentiate between grasslands with varying quality. So for example, we're hoping that native grass prairies will be able to be distinguished from ranch pastures that are dominated by coastal Bermuda. High and low quality grasslands are very different and should be treated that way when you're mapping. The Texas coastal, Texas Louisiana coastal prairies are found on level to gently rolling landscapes and the micro topography of the area plays a big role in what plant species are there. So these prairies can be found on ridges, swales, mounds, depressions, and Mima mounds or Gilgai and this Variation in topography will also lead to a different drier and wetter plant communities. But generally, they are mid to tall grass prairies on non saline soils, and plants that can be included uh, are little blue stem, Indian grass, brown seed pass pollen, switchgrass, and others. Another common EMS type is the coastal bin, riparian, hardwood forest, and other variations. So this is all riparian uh, habitat types. This is a part of all of the riparian habitat types in the western Gulf Coast Plain. It's found in upland drainages that receive water from surrounding level landscapes, so they accumulate a ton of moisture. Riparian hardwood forests have deciduous trees dominating the, land, the canopy. Common species in the canopy will be sugar hackberry, cedar elm, pecan, black willow, and other woody species. Honey mesquite, weasatch, and Texas persimmon are common understory components. And there are a lot of other, like I said, there are a lot of other variations of riparian EMS types in the, Gulf, the Western Gulf Coast Plain, like live oak forest, live oak hardwood forest, deciduous shrublands, and many others, but they're generally found in these same areas. Then moving into the unique or cool EMS types, we have mangrove shrublands, which are super cool because I think everybody knows mangroves do help to help water quality and they're really sturdy plants, but unfortunately mangrove expansion might replace coastal marsh areas and have impacts on ecosystem services. So this is a really interesting field of research because uh, there are, there's currently an expansion of mangrove shrublands in Texas. The composition of these marshes is influenced by the frequency and duration of tidal flooding. So the areas that these mangrove shrublands can be found in have varying composition, but they're pretty much found in low marshes that are regularly flooded. And as you move south, this EMS type becomes more common. And lastly, another cool EMS type is the live oak forest and woodland in the Columbia bottomlands area of the Western Gulf Coastal Plains. This area is composed of mixed hardwood forests across the floodplains of the Colorado, San Bernard, and Brazos rivers and their associated bayous. The Columbia bottomlands are known to provide wintering habitat for migratory birds, so they're very important. And this Columbia bottomlands uh, area is unique because it's an inland flat bottomland forest surrounded by prairies, which you don't see in Texas as much. Um, the EMS type that we chose, the live oak forest and woodland, is typically found on the drier sites, on levees and ridges, uh, and it's dominated, obviously, by coastal live oak. So miscellaneous characteristics of the uh, Western Gulf Coast Plain. The biggest exports are agriculture and oil, which, as we've already explained, have huge impacts on conservation and the area. So species of greatest conservation need, uh, the first one we're gonna talk about is Texas windmill grass or Chloris texensis. It's endemic to Texas and it's put into danger by habitat destruction due to urbanization. This grass is just part of the overall endangered coastal Texas or Texas coastal prairie. Then we have Kent's 
Kemp's Ridley sea turtle. And these are the smallest sea turtles, uh, like out of all of the sea turtles. These turtles prefer open ocean and Gulf waters. Young turtles float on mats of algae in the Gulf of Mexico and Atlantic Ocean. A nesting population has been established on Padre Island National Seashore, which is super cool. Uh, I think it's they're still nesting there, as far as I know. Current threats do come from fishing, of course, so shrimping nets specifically and trash floating in the water that they mistake for food. And I wanted to just, again, emphasize that the challenges in the area are grassland loss due to economic industry. So here is a special mention to the coastal sand plain. Uh, remember how we discussed earlier that different maps have different levels of complexity? Well, this region, the coastal sand plain, is in the level four Omernick map. Like I said, it, it the level four Omernick map divides ecoregions into more detailed subregions. The coastal sand plain is also present in the natural regions map of Texas, which is what the TMN uh, recertification pin is based on. So we wanted to give a little more information and explain why it's unique. So interestingly, there is some debate about whether this ecoregion should be placed in the Western Gulf Coastal Plain or the Southern Te or South Texas Plains region. It was put in the Western Gulf Coastal Plain uh, region for now, so that is why it's in this section. Fauna, the fauna and freshwater biology of this area are more similar to South Texas, but the soil and geology are more similar to the Western Gulf, Gulf, Gulf Coastal Plain. And uh, since the geology is the big part of why this area is unique, I think it makes sense why it's in the West, Western Gulf Coastal Plain ecoregion for the Omernick map. So uh, the climate of the region, it's a bit it gets a bit less precipitation than the rest of the Western uh, Gulf Coastal Plain. Oops, sorry. I meant to go next on here. This little star denotes where it is on the map. It's this little brown region uh, on the south end of the coast. So this area relieves, receives less precipitation than the rest of the Western Gulf, the, the Western Gulf Coastal Plains. Uh, the average annual precipitation is 24 to 27 inches per year, and it's less humid than the South Texas, or sorry, it's more humid than the South Texas Plain. So it's got kind of distinguishing climate, uh, climate factors from each of the ecoregions it borders. The, topop the topography of the area is level to rolling, and very generally put, if you were to describe the landscape, it's a grassy dune and swale landscape in most of the area. And a swale is also, for anyone who doesn't know, is a low or hollow place. And the geology, like I said, is what makes this area unique. It consists of wind-worked quaternary sand, and it is up to six feet deep in some places. Um, and the reason the sands were deposited in such a thick sheet sheet in their present location is unknown. So that's kind of a cool mystery in the state of Texas. So the vegetation of the area, the unique ge geology and climate has produced a lot of different habitats. The uh, uplands support grasslands dotted with live oak mots and mesquite mots, blowing dunes and uh, coastal wind tidal flats, which are barren flats that are subject to flooding by wind tides. Very general, uh, also the eastern side of the sand plain closer to the coast has four blands on these wind tidal flats and a gradient of salt marsh to gulf uh, cord grass grasslands. Some EMS types, some common EMS types in the area uh, is deep sand, live oak forest, and woodland. These are obviously found on deep sand. At Plateau Live Oak is the uh, dominating canopy species. The plant associations uh, in the coastal sand plain differ uh, from the live oak forests in the northern West Gulf coastal plains. So 
there are live oak forests along the coast, but the ones in South Texas in the, in the coastal sand plain have commonly have the association of live oak, honey mesquite, and Turk's cap. This woodland occurs uh, in the deep sand grassy matrix. So what you'll see is groups of oak trees forming what we call mots and grasslands that go around it and between these different live oak woodland groupings. Other plants that could be uh, present in the overstory include coastal laurel oak, sugar hackberry, and blackjack oak, but they are usually present to a lesser degree. Another common EMS type is coastal and sand sheep, dune and coastal grassland, also called deep sand grasslands. And these are those upland grasslands that I was speaking of that kind of go, they form matrix, matrices around these uh, woodland areas within the coastal sand plain. These grasslands are dominated by seacoast blue stem and gulf dune blue stem species like Indian grass, brown seed, paspalum, gulf muley might also be present. And a really cool EMS type, I think these are always fascinating, are active sand dunes. This is when you come across barrens that are sparsely vegetated on deep sands and there's active sand movement occurring. These dunes can get up to 15 feet or more in height, so they're super cool. And they also just kind of look like they're from a different world. So next we're gonna be looking at the Eastern Central Texas Plains, more commonly known as the Post Oak Savannah. To put you guys here, we have some awesome pictures. This, uh, this area was originally covered by post oak savanna habitat in contrast to the more open prairie regions to the north, south, and west, and the pine forest to the east. So it's the big transition area between the different ecoregions of uh, Texas. Uniquely, many areas have a dense underlying clay pan affecting moisture movement and available moisture for plant growth. So un we'll get into it more in the next slide, but most soil has these thick clay layers underneath them. The bulk of the region is now used for pasture and range though, unfortunately. So these native landscapes are also going away in the name of industry. For the abiotic characteristics of the post oak savanna, as you can see from the map, it still gets pretty high at rainfall for the rest of Texas. There, uh, it receives about 28 to 40 inches per year and rainfall peaks in May or June. The average temperatures range from 46 degrees Fahrenheit to 82.9 degrees Fahrenheit. The topography of the area is gently rolling terrain to hilly, to hilly areas. Elevations range from 300 to 800 feet above sea level. So getting back to the soils that we're talking about, Earlier, upland soils are light colored, acidic, sandy, loam, or sands. Bottomland soils might be brown to dark gray and acidic with textures from sandy loam to clay. And again, dense clay layers lie underneath all these soil types, which is kind of unique. Generally put, the ecoregion, like I said, is a transition region with grassland mosaics passing through oak-dominated forest. Fire plays a really big role in shape, or well, used to play a really big role in shaping the landscape in the area and the Blackland Prairie ecoregion, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. Fire maintained plant communities in the area by suppressing invading woody species and stimulating prairie grass and forb growth. Additionally, there was historic grazing by bison that would maintain the grasslands. And now without those factors, woody growth, woody overgrowth is becoming more common. And common invaders of the area due to this woody overgrowth include yopon and juniper. And we call these native invasives because they have formed these monodominant stands um, that they wouldn't typically if natural cycles were in play, natural fire cycles and management. So 
The, one of the most common EMS types is savanna grassland, and this asterisk is to also go over kind of like what we talked about in the coastal prairie uh, EMS type. There is a lot of quality differences in this EMS type, and we are working on a way to be able to distinguish them. But for now, these savanna grasslands are on gently to rolling gently rolling to hilly topography with sandy to sandy loam soils. Savannah grasslands represent a herbaceous component in the post oak savanna, which is, a, which is overall, like we said earlier, a mosaic of woody and herbaceous cover types. This is that herbaceous cover type. These grasslands are present in patches between oak woodlands and are, and are areas of transition. Common grasses include big blue stem, brown seed paspalum, and many bromus species. More commonly, though, now non-native grasses include KR, blue stem, bahia grass, and Bermuda grass, unfortunately. <laughs> Another common ES EMS type is the post oak savanna, post oak yopon, mott, and woodland. Let's see. not letting me progress or it's I don't know if you guys can see this I'm having some technology issues I can see the slide that says post oak savanna vegetation uh-huh the photo has not changed though I don't think so okay well let's see. you want to unshare and then reshare is it changing now it's changed now we're on miscellaneous okay well i will just go through this without the photos i saw the information that is needed so i'm sorry you guys but we won't have the photos to show a post oak yopon mott and woodland but i'm sure a lot of you guys can envision what it looks like it's a post oak forest with yopon filling the understory we've probably all seen it um so this EMS type is the represents a transition from woodlands and forests of East Texas to the prairies of the Blackland Prairie to the Blackland Prairies to the west. It's post oak dominated woodlands, and the con the canopy can also include blackjack oak, black hickory, cedar elm, and other tree species but the composition of the canopy will vary depending on where you are in the region but a common factor is that yopon will make up the understory of the vegetation type and another common ems type sorry again no photo and range map for it those do exist online my apologies uh, is the floodplain hardwood forest and other variations of floodplain landscapes in the post oak savanna. Uh, these different floodplain uh, EMS types occupy broad flats at low topographic positions along large waterways such as the Sabine and Trinity Rivers. The canopy is dominated by deciduous, well, for the, for, sorry, for the hardwood forest eco, ecosystem type, which is, I think, the most commonly encountered floodplain eco, EMS type. The canopy is going to be dominated by deciduous species such as pecan, ash, and elm trees. The composition of the woody species will change again depending on how moisture rich the area is and also where you are in the post oak savanna region. So more east or more west where you are will affect what species are commonly growing there. And Another, the one of the cool ecoregions, in my opinion, is the sandy land grassland EMS type in the post oak savanna. Again, no photos, but these photos do exist online and the range map exists online. Uh, these are located at high topographic positions al along rapidly draining deep sand. So it's pretty cool because these grasslands are on uh, really deep sands, which is just weird to come across i feel like when you walk in a grassland you don't expect your feet to be covered with sand you think more like rich soil so i think it's very interesting to find these grasslands on these sandy systems that we don't really think of as nutrient rich or capable of supporting grasslands 
But when this system is found, it's kind of cool because it'll show you that there is a, a fire cycle that's more consistent with the presumed natural cycle. This is not an EMS type that can be maintained through lack of fire. Uh, it's a small pouch system with herbaceous plants dominating the area and um, the cover might be kind of sparse and there might be a lot of exposed, uh, exposed sand. Common species in this area could be curly threon, piney woods drop seed, pinweed, purple sand grass, and other species. And again, kind of the same thing. This will be a common trend that we see with lots of EMS types is that the species composition can change depending on where you are in the eastern central Texas Plains ecoregion or post oak savannah ecoregion. Okay. There we go. So miscellaneous characteristics of the uh, post oak savanna. The ex major exports of the area are cattle ranching and agriculture. And we've already kind of explained why those have impacted the area. But to repeat, cattle ranching promotes the use of non-native grasses because of their dry, drought tolerance. And also cattle do a great job, unfortunately, of moving uh, invasive seeds around. So they, they kind of serve as a vector for uh, non-native grass spread. Some species of greatest conservation need in the area include Abronia macrocarpa, which is the large fruited sand verbena. This is found on deep sandy soils with sparse vegetation and post oak woodland savannas. Or it can also, it doesn't even have to be in a grassland. It could also be just in a smaller opening within a woodland. Cool, this is really cool, I think. This species is pollinated by moths, so the flowers open at night. Threats to the species come from competition with invasive grasses and conversion of open grasslands to dense woodlands. Uh, another species of greatest conservation need in the area is the Houston toad or an, an sorry Anaxerus houstonensis. Our team actually just completed a project using GIS technology and statistical modeling to map habitat for the Houston toad. From what we know, they prefer forested areas with loblolly pine, post oak, blackjack or sandjack oak, yopon, and little blue stem. They burrow in the sand for protection, making the relatively sandy soil of the eastern central Texas plains optimal. For breeding, they need shallow ponds or temporary water sources, which could include rain pools, flooded fields, blocked drainages, and depressions that hold water, which also makes them very hard to map because these aren't constant uh, aquatic habitats. They come and go. Threats to the species come from habitat loss due to development and agriculture. And another threat comes from the conversion of ephemeral wetlands to permanent ponds because it will increase predation, competition, and hybridization with other frog species. Challenges in the area are these native savannas being lost. We're seeing a trend here in Texas that's just gonna continue. It, uh, invasive species and development like urban development are also big problems in the area. Okay, so Texas Blackland Prairie is the next eco region we're going to discuss. Beautiful, diverse grasslands, and it was historically grazed by bison and maintained by fire, much like the post oak savanna. The Blackland Prairie was once covered with diverse prairie grasses and is now a higher percentage of cropland than adjacent regions. Large areas of the region are now being converted into urban and industrial uses and very, very little of native Texas blackland prairie remains. So climate in the region, uh, as you can see, it still gets pretty high precipitation in comparison to the rest of the state 
but there is some variation from north to south. The northern region of the Blackland Prairie has rain peak in May, and it gets a little more rain. And the south central region has uniformly distributed rain throughout the year, but it gets a little less rain overall. The average annual rainfall across the whole Blackland Prairie is 28 to 40 inches, with some variation in peak precipitation like we discussed. Average temperatures range from 47.8 degrees Fahrenheit to 83.6 degrees Fahrenheit. Topography in the area is gently rolling to level. Elevations range from 300 to 800 feet above sea level, so we are moving up as we go, as we move west. The soils are uniformly dark colored alkaline clays called black gumbo, and I found out that this is the state soil of Texas. Very cool. And this black gumbo is interspersed with uh, gray acidic sandy loams. Texas Blackland Prairie is very uh, fertile soil, so that is why so much of the region has been converted into agriculture. Generally put, the ecoregion's vegetation is covered with crops and non-native forage plants. But it was once a very diverse prairie with grasses like big blue stem and Indian grass. Common EMS types in the area, again, I wish I didn't have to put this, but row crops is one of the biggest EMS types in the region because of those very nutrient rich soils. The next most common EMS type is the Blackland Prairie Disturbance or TAM grassland. And the asterisk is there again to acknowledge the variation in um, grassland quality that we are trying to tackle in our team. This uh, EMS type is found on flat to gently rolling land. It's this, you know, the range that it shows, the actual, the actual range of these native vegetation types is much smaller. But as it stands now, a lot of this uh, grassland will be comprised of KR blue stem and Bermuda grass. Another common EMS type throughout the Blackland Prairies is the Central Texas Riparian Herbaceous Vegetation EMS type. This is commonly found around drainage areas and streams throughout the Blackland Prairie ecoregion. It's in areas that are adjacent to rivers and streams and composed of herbaceous plants like cocklebur, uh, blue mist flower, inland sea oats, rye grasses, and many other species. These are typically more diverse than what I see in surrounding grassland areas, so they're kind of fun to come across. A unique EMS type is a native prairie. We don't have this map right now, but hopefully that's going to change. A blackland prairie, native prairie. Uh, undisturbed blackland prairie only exists in a one, about 1% 1 of the region, and that amount, amount is decreasing. Remnant prairies exist in small patches, but haven't been well mapped. So that 1% could, you know, not be exactly accurate, but so take that into consideration, unfortunately. I hope it's higher than that, but I'm kind of a little bit of a pessimist when it comes to that. <laughs> uh, yeah, sorry, that's so sad. <laughs> so for the miscellaneous characteristics, the exports of the region are agriculture and cattle. I think we've gotten the point across about how they've affected the landscape. So for species of greatest conservation need, the Navasota false foxglove or Agalinus navasotensis. There are only two known populations that exist on either privately owned or on right-of-way roads in Grimes and Tyler counties. The population counts of this species could be an underestimate because the species is really difficult to detect when it's not in flower fruit in flower or fruit. I don't know if anybody's ever tried to identify a foxglove or a false fo foxglove, the Agalinus uh, genus, but it is very difficult, even when they are in flower. Uh, historically, these plants, though, have been found in Grimes, Jasper, Newton, and Tyler counties. The population is due to, you guessed it, habitat loss. <laughs> uh, 
another species of greatest conservation need in the Texas Blackland Prairie is the plain spotted skunk. Or, and it, this is a subspecies of the eastern spotted skunk, and they are distinguished by their fur patterns and that the plain spotted skunk is found in prairie habitats. Plain spotted skunks have a wide range across the United States. Uh, or sorry, eastern spotted skunks have a wide range across Texas, uh, across the United States, but in Texas, the plain spotted skunk occurs east of the Balcones Escarpment. The decrease in the, sp the plain spotted skunk, sorry, that is a mouthful. The plain spotted skunk uh, are thought, the decline in the plain spotted skunk population are thought to coincide with the decline of tall grass prairies in the 1940s. So loss of tall grass prairies took away a lot of valuable protection for the species. So again, really just to drive it home and make everybody sad, challenges in the area are native prairie loss. These tall grass prairies have a huge impact on uh, soil health. The grasses have roots growing 8 to 10 feet deep in the soil and that contributes to soil stability and soil nutrient cycling. The soil of the Blackland Prairie is so fertile because of the ecosystems that were there for years and that contributed greatly to the economic success in North Texas. Additionally, healthy prairies can hold on to clean water more efficiently than cropland or cultivated grassland. One acre of blackland prairie can hold 250,000 gallons of water. That is astonishing. And not to mention the dense vegetation of a healthy prairie can capture significant amounts of carbon, which is super important during uh, this time of intense climate change. Next ecoregion is the South Texas Plains. This was an area that was once covered with grassland and savanna vegetation that varied, that varied in composition during wet and dry cycles. Grazing and fire suppression allowed for thorny brush to over, well, overgrazing and fire suppression specifically, uh, allowed thorny brush to become the dominant vegetation type. Now known as the brush country, the southern Texas Plains region has its greatest extent in Mexico. The area has a diverse mosaic of soil that allows for a lot of diversity in plant and animal life. As you can see from these photos, there's a lot to see in South Texas. For the abiotic characteristics, it's getting a bit drier. As you can see from the precipitation map, the average annual rainfall is 20 to 32 inches. Rainfall decreases as you move from east to west in the region. It gets the most rain in the spring and fall and the, le the least during the winter. Summer temperatures are very high and winters are relatively mild. Average temperatures range from 53.1 to 85.3 degrees Fahrenheit. The topography of the area is almost flat to gently rolling, and the elevations range from 300 to 1,000 feet above sea level. So again, we are gaining elevation as we move to the west. The soils of the area ha are a mosaic of mostly clay, clay loam, sandy clay loam textures ranging from alkaline to slightly acidic, and also acidic sands are common in the area. Some areas of South Texas also have a shallow root restricted layer of cemented caliche, which is basically mineral deposits of gravel, sand, and nitrates. The ecoregion uh, vegetation generally is thorny shrubs, trees, and patches of subtropical woodlands in the Rio Grande Valley. Shrublands arose as grasses were grazed by livestock, which eroded the soil structure, thus leaving rocky, dry soils. Common shrubs include honey mesquite, huizach, and guajillo. Prior to settlement, though, grasslands were thought to be a major component of the system. This appears to be a trend in Texas, huh? Uh, common EMS, a common EMS type found in this region is the clay, clayey mesquite mixed shrubland, which is differentiated from uh, the sandy mesquite shrubland that we'll be discussing next because the clayey mesquite shrubland is on tighter soils with higher clay content. These clayey mesquite mixed shrublands are often, often found lower in the landscape compared to the sandy 
uh, mesquite shrublands or woodlands. They are usually more closed also than sandy uh, mesquite woodland and shrublands because the um, the, clo the the soil being more tight and clay heavy will allow more shrubs to establish themselves. So there's not a savanna matrix component to these clayey mesquite mixed shrublands like there is in the sandy mesquite shrublands. Common woody species include mesquite, obviously, and also huisach and ebony and sugar hackberry, kind of usually not as tall as the mesquite, but like lower, but not considered the understory, if that makes sense. The understory typically contains prickly pear, lote bush, and ganahero. Species composition varies, though, with land use, his land use history and age. And the uh, herbaceous layer of this EMS type is pretty sparse, so we won't go into that. Now we move into discussing the sandy mesquite woodland and shrubland, which you've already kind of explained how it's different than the clayey mesquite mixed shrubland. This occurs on sands, sandy loams, and loamy sands. Sandy mesquite woodlands and shrublands are very commonly um, also. They very commonly occur amidst a grassy matrix, so these deep sands can keep shrub cover lighter, which allows for grasslands to come into the landscape. The canopy is about six meters in height and comprised of mesquite and weasatch. The shrub layer will usually contain Texas persimmon, Colima, Brazil, and black brush. And then the next common EMS type is the South Texas sandy mesquite savanna grassland. <laughs> These are a mouthful to keep naming. Um, the sandy mesquite savanna grassland is that grassland matrix that we were just discussing, kind of going in between and through these sandy mesquite woodland and shrublands. So these areas are grass dominated sandy site, sites with patchy overstories. The sandy mesquite savanna grassland is the grassy matrix uh, species commonly found in these grasslands include little blue stem, seacoast blue stem, silver blue stem, and other grasses. Many sites are also are also unfortunately dominated by non-native species like Bermuda grass and buffalo grass. A unique EMS type are these South Texas palm groves. It's not really in the South Texas ecoregion, but it. It kind of is, and it's we 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 categorize it into South Texas, but it's limited to small groves that are less than 20 hectares of Sabala of Sabala Mexicana, also known as Mexican sable palm, and they exist in loamy or clay bottom land soils adjacent to Mexico. This EMS type might have occurred along the Rio Grande, but is now limited to just a few sites near. At, near the Gulf in Southern Hildago County. Next, a cool EMS type is South Texas salt, salty thorn scrub. Uh, these are open shrublands on sites where soil salinity is high on, and usually they're on saline clays. When soil salinity though is not extreme, it will be occupied by a different EMS type. So the type of soil present really will shape uh, whether or not this EMS type exists. I always find it really interesting when plants thrive in salty areas, like out of all of the places you can grow, why, why, why are you putting up with such salty conditions? Like that seems extremely unpleasant to be stuck in, but they, they do. <laughs> the diversity in shrublands uh, really, the diversity in shrublands really displays the soil diversity of South Texas that we briefly touched on. Some of the common halophytic uh, shrubs found in the area, and halophytic basically means salt tolerant, uh, include Texas varilla, golden weed, seep weeds, and tornillo. So for the miscellaneous characteristics of the South Texas Plains, oil and ranching are some of the biggest industries in South Texas, and they have obviously impacted the landscape from what we've seen. 
Some really cool species of greatest conservation need include star cactus, which is Astrophytum asterius. This occurs in the Rio Grande Valley of South Texas, specifically in Star and Zapata counties, but historically also in Hidalgo counties. And also it was reported in Cameron County, but there is no known habitat, habitat there that the star cactus would thrive in. This is a spineless cactus with yellow flowers that have a red to orange center. The star cactus is preferring habitats that are gravelly, somewhat salty clay or loam soils in areas with sparse vegetation among grassy thorn scrub. It flowers in March through May and the star cactus is widely available for sale among growers. The threat to the species is thought to be from overcollection in the last 150 years. And another threat comes from brush eradication, overgrazing, destruction of natural vegetation for cultivation of different crops. Another uh, species of greatest conservation need, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard about, is the ocelot, Leopardu pardalis. This, the ocelot resides in dense thorny shrublands in the lower Rio Grande Valley and Rio Grande Plains. And it's really interesting for this plant, uh, sorry, not plant, I'm used to saying plant for everything, this animal. Uh, dense canopy cover is extremely important for ocelot habitat. In fact, the optimal habitat is at least 95% canopy cover of shrubs. Shrub density below uh, the six foot level is the most important component of ocelot habitat. Shrub density should be such that the depth of vision from outside the brush line is restricted to about five feet. So this is really, really, really thick uh, woodland. And only about 1% of South Texas supports this optimal habitat as it was defined. Much of the suitable habitat has been converted to agriculture and urban development over the last 60 years. Additionally, the soil types that support this really thick brush needed for the ocelot is really fertile, so it's prime for agriculture. Uh, also, a more modern danger to the ocelot population are roadways. So watch where you're driving. Oops. All right, the next uh, ecoregion is the Edwards Plateau. This region is largely dissected is largely dissected by a limestone plateau that is, and it's hillier in the south and east. This region generally contains a network of streams and it has a ton of endemic plants. So this is my personal favorite ecoregion. I think it's just absolutely beautiful. It's covered with these juniper oak savannas and mesquite oak savannas, diverse riparian areas and savanna grasslands. You get just these gorgeous views. I mean, it's truly stunning. So the abiotic characteristics of the area, we are getting a lot drier and there is a lot of variation as you move to the west within the Edwards Plateau region in terms of uh, rainfall. Average rainfall is 15 to 34 inches. Rainfall is highest in May or June and also in September. The average annual temperature is 46 degrees Fahrenheit to 82.3 degrees Fahrenheit. General, general description of the topography, it's got a lot of features. Uh, it's a landscape of springs, stony hills, and steep canyons. The limestone soil has is honeycombed with lots and lots of caves, very cool, um, and huge elevation range that goes from 100 feet to over 3,000 feet above sea level. For the soil in the area, they are shallow with a variety of surface textures and all underlain by limestone. Soils are generally, soils are in general have high clay contents and are neutral to alkaline with high calcium carbonate, which comes from the limestone. For the vegetation in the area, the landscape is characterized by grasslands, woodlands, oops, 
grasslands, woodlands, and plateau live oak forests, mesquite savannas. It's really, really, really diverse. It's hard to kind of put into a paragraph how much vegetation variation exists, but unfortunately, a lot of it is dominated by low quality browse, borb, and grass plants. Overgrazing and fire suppression has shaped the area and converted a lot of it from grasslands to brushland, which again, we see is a kind of a common trend throughout Texas, right? Um, the, one of the most common EMS types in the area is the Edwards Plateau, Ash, Juniper, Mott, and Woodland. This is a part of an upland system that forms a matrix of vegetation types. It contains mosaics of juniper forests, woodlands, and savanna grasslands over shallow, shallow soils of rolling uplands. The ash juniper mott and woodland is a relatively closed woodland in the upland limestone areas, and it crosses also over into adjacent ecoregions. So you'll see a lot of these ash juniper mott and woodlands in, say, the uh, cross timbers region, southwestern tablelands. There's a lot of bleed over because ash juniper just does well all over the place. Ash juniper will dominate the canopy, canopy, and it will also be present in the shrub layer. And different juniper species will make appearances depending on where you are in the Edwards Plateau. So from east to west, you'll see the appearance of different uh, juniper species, but it will be dominated by ash juniper throughout. And there is usually a very sparse vegetation layer and not a lot going on. Next, a common EMS type in the area is the oak and ash juniper slope forest EMS type. These forests are on rocky slopes, co-dominated by ash juniper and plateau live oak, and they usually occur in dry to semi-moisture rich middle slopes of the rolling uplands. Next, we have the riparian live oak forest. And this will be found in small streams that tend to be on erosional soils. The riparian live oak forest is characterized as woodlands dominated by live oaks, uh, plateau live oak, with ash juniper also being present in the canopy to a lesser degree. So we kind of discussed how there's lots of streams going through this eager region, and that's where these riparian uh, these riparian EMS types will find their home. Next, for a cool EMS type, we have playas. These can be found, um, and the, the picture is not the best because it was taken at a distance, but they're shallow wetlands that occur over limestone. They vary in size and how long they're flooded, but they're typically found in the level upland areas of the Edwards Plateau. The dominant vegetation includes grasses and forbs that are tolerant of wet periods, but not considered wetland dependent plants. So they like more moisture, but they're not dependent on it. They can kind of deal with some fluctuations. Larger occurrences of this wetland system occur in Crockett, Reagan, Schleicher, uh, sorry if I mispronounced that for anybody who lives in that county, Erion and Sterling counties in the Northwest Edwards Plateau. Some common plants include white tridents, yellow stone crop, and Western ragweed, silver night leaf nightshade, and, and many more. And another non-mapped uh, EMS type that we are working on is the Edwards Plateau Mesic Canyon. These occur on rich loams that are often rocky with little soil development. This mesic canyon vegetation type occurs at the transition between slope and riparian slash floodplain uh, system. So it's got a little less moisture. This EMS type is endemic to the Edwards Plateau. You can't find it anywhere else. And it occurs on canyon bottoms, mesic lower slopes, and steep canyons. Primarily, it's found in the southern Balcones escarpment. And it contains more rich, moisture-loving plants like the ash tree, Texas ash, 
uh, Big Tooth Maple, Burr Oak, Maidenhair Fern. This photo came from Lost Maple State Park. It's a great uh, example of what this might look like. And we are currently working on a project to get these mapped. But it is hard to find them because they're not super uh, common. All right, miscellaneous characteristics of the Edwards Plateau. Cattle is the biggest economic industry, and there because there's also a lack of soils that are suitable for farming, but that makes for plenty of area for grazing. Species of greatest conservation need include Texas wild rice, Zizania texana. It is very restricted in its uh, range. It's only known from the upper two miles of the San Marcos River in Hayes County. The Texas wild rice is a clumping perennial grass that roots underwater in riverbeds and it grows in gravelly or coarse sandy soils in clear, cool, fast flowing waters of string fed rivers. The threats, it is threatened due to factors associated with its urban location near the headwaters of the San Marcos River uh, because there's habitat alteration due to construction, non-native species that come through from just people being people, pollution from the city and the university and recreation because a lot of people love the river. And then we have the golden cheek warbler. I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with this. This is a widely discussed uh, endangered species. These birds only nest in central Texas in mixed ash juniper and oak woodlands in the ravines and canyons. Habitat for golden cheek warblers is tall ash juniper oaks and other hardwood tree woodlands. Golden cheek warblers are threatened due to tall junipers and oak woodlands being cleared for construction and infrastructure uh, because everybody wants to move to the hill country. Also ranching causes uh, these woodlands to be cleared and they are also uh, flooded. These woodlands are flooded when lakes are built. All right, we have another special mention area uh, right here, this little yellow region where the star is. If you can see, this is called the Llano Uplift. This is uh, a part of the natural regions map, so we thought that it was important to explain why it was unique. Uh, the Llano Uplift is known for large granite domes, and the area includes several major rock quarries that mine a distinctive pink granite. Enchanted Rock is a well-known area of tourism. There is debate among geologists about whether this area contains the only known deposits of lanite. And I don't know much about lanite, but uh, it, this could be the only region that you can find it. But apparently there's some disagreement among geologists. Uh, the rocks of the Llano uplift uh, come from the Precambrian era, which predates even the oldest dinosaurs. Granite, the granite in the area is exposed because younger sedimentary rocks eroded away and the hills that you see in the area are formed when the Balcon Balcones fault shifted. Soil in the area is sandy loams and gravelly soil commonly in the upland areas. There are some clay soils in more bottomland regions of the Llano Uplift. Soils are generally acidic because of the weathering of the underlying granite. Uh, and there are also a lot of areas of exposed bedrock. You can also find lots of large boulders on the soil surface. And management con soil management concerns include brush control, large stones, and limited soil moisture. Oh, here, whoops, I forgot. Here's like a, here's a photo of what the Llano Uplift landscape looks like. And then this photo at the bottom is the, the infamous Lanite. Uh, beauty is in the high of the beholder. I'm not sure exactly what uh, stone uh, <laughs> or rock that people are, are a fan of, but it's pretty cool that it might only be found in the Llano Uplift. So vegetation of the area. Uh, it's a mosaic 
of vegetation types like closed canopy forests, open woodlands, grasslands, and sparsely vegetated outcrops. Uh, common EMS types in the area, in the Llano Uplift area, are live oak woodlands. It's dominated, the Llano Uplift live oak woodland is dominated by plateau live oak, and this is the most common forest and woodland type in the Llano Uplift. Other common plants making up the woodland habitat might, habitat might include ash juniper, post oak, blackjack, oak, and others. The Llano Uplift, another common EMS type is the Llano Uplift post oak woodland. Forests and woodlands that aren't dominated by live oak are generally dominated by post oak with uh, blackjack oak and black hickory making appearances to lesser degrees as well. I think this area is really interesting because in comparison to the rest of the uh, Edwards Plateau, ash juniper plays a much less dominant role. And uh, my best guess as to why is that it's right next to the post oak savanna uh, ecoregion. So some of those characteristics must bleed in to the Llano uplift, which is pretty cool. Another common EMS type is the Llano uplift grassland. These are small patches of grassland between these woodland matrices. Species composition includes grasses like little blue stems, side oats, gramma, hairy gramma, and other common Texas natives. Unfortunately, non-native grasses frequently dominate the herbaceous layer like a lot of the other Texas grasslands. Scattered trees and shrubs might be present, but at a very small capacity. Um, and a cool EMS type is the Llano Uplift uh, Acidic Glade. These are also not mapped. So I got this photo from uh, some photos of Enchanted Rock online. The opening, these are openings on, of exposed granite rock outcrops. This kind of area is common throughout the Llano Uplift, but unique to Texas as a whole. This area is characterized by folios and crustose lichens, which make up a significant amount of cover, so not a ton of vegetation. We've got lichens. It's pretty difficult to map because uh, there is limited soil data, and these uh, outcrops occur in small patches. But hopefully, again, as higher resolution imagery comes out, we'll be able to map these. So species in these vegetation communities are sparse, or vegetate, sorry, plant species in these, plant cover in these communities are sparse, but they might include Peruvian spike moss, reddle spike moss, right plantain, and some other species. Also, you can find small depressions in the granite that might hold water and have really cool and unique floristic elements, as you can see in this photo. And I think that this is such a cool area that someone could research. So the next ecoregion we're gonna discuss is the cross timbers. This is the uh, transitional area between the, one, the once prairie and now winter growing regions of the West and the forested low mountains or hills of Eastern Oklahoma and Texas. Generally, it is a mosaic of forest, woodland, savanna, and prairie. The abiotic characteristics, it gets a moderate amount of rainfall but the amount of rainfall can be kind of erratic. So moisture is a limiting, uh, is a limiting characteristic in the area. The region gets about 27 to 32 inches of rain a year, and the average temperatures range from 43.4 degrees Fahrenheit and 83.5 degrees Fahrenheit. The general landscape of the area is hilly, rolling, and well-drained. In the center of the region, there is more variation in topography and ranching is more common. The north and south regions are more flat and there is more agriculture present. And elevations range from 400 to 1700 feet above sea level. Soils are generally neutral to acidic in the western cross timbers and alkaline in the prairie soils that are more to the east. And they are primary sandy to loamy. And there's a lot of variation in the cross timbers region. 
uh, in terms of vegetation. So I thought it would be easiest to give you guys yet another map and break down the different vegetation general types uh, across the cross timbers region. So this kind of pale yellow uh, strip is the eastern cross timbers. Hopefully you guys can read the labels on the map, but that's the eastern cross timbers. And it's that narrow strip of land on the eastern e edge. And it was once a continuous strip of woodland, but now those woodlands are extremely disturbed and fragmented uh, because a lot of it has been cleared for grass, pastures, agriculture, and ranching. Then the green portion of the map is the Fort Worth Prairie or the Grand Prairie, whichever you prefer. It's located between the eastern and western cross timbers as a strip of land down the middle of the ecoregion and north of the Brazos River. It was once a prairie, but now it's uh, largely used for livestock grazing and, ag grazing and agriculture, um, but now only in, and then pockets of those uh, grasslands remain. Then we have the Lampasas Cup Plain, which is this kind of like bluish gray region in the south of the map. This is the strip of land south of the Brazos, and it extends into the upper reaches of the Edwards Plateau and between, and it exists between the east and west cross timbers. It's characterized by a mesa topography with wide lowlands intervening the mesa uplands. And a mesa is just a flat top till pretty much. And historically, this was a grassland and oak savanna system, but now wooded areas are uh, kind of covered with native invasive species like mesquite and ash juniper, and the grasslands are being invaded by less desirable grasses and forbs. Then to the west, this big orange region is the Western Cross Timbers, which is located west of the Fort Worth Prairie or Grand Prairie and north of the Lampasas Cut Plain. Ranching is increasingly common in this area and winter forage crops like wheat and oat is common. Boop, boop, boop. My bad. Sorry, sorry. Oops. Okay. Here we go. Um, this is a more hilly area and it has a lot of different plant communities in it. Um, a common, a common uh, composition is wood, the black, blackjack oak and post oak woodlands. And I'm just going to mention this, this uh, little pink portion, the carbonate cross timbers is within that bigger orange region is kind of more reminiscent of the uh, Edwards Plateau region. Uh, as indicated by the name, it's got those more limestoney kind of soils. But it is the, I, I needed a second to uh, distinguish the cross timbers from the post oak savanna because I think they have a lot of similar characteristics. But the post oak, it's different from the post oak savanna because of the soil and geology. The cross timbers region has limestone and sandstone soils and more hilly topography than the post oak savanna, even though uh, the plant communities are very, very similar. So I thought that that was important to mention. I don't know if anybody else was uh, confused like I was. <laughs> so a common EMS type in the region is the cross timbers post oak woodland. This woodland is dominated by post oak and blackjack oak. The understory may have historically been dominated by little blue stem, but current overstories are determined by land use history and grazing pressure. So a lot of them have become more woody. Another common EMS type is the cross timber savanna grassland. Uh, this is where there is primarily herbace herbaceous cover and they tend to be on tighter soils with high clay contents, but, but um, they really depend on uh, land management to ensure that woody cover doesn't take over. And again, Little blue stem was historically the dominant system, uh, grass in this system, but now grass composition varies depending on land use and grazing pressure. 
Next, a very common EMS type in the area is the oak and hardwood slope forest. This is a closed canopy forest that exists on slopes and is dominated by deciduous trees. Uh, it is primarily uh, oak trees that make up the canopy like post oak, chinkapin oak, blackjack oak. There is some variation in the canopy's composition depending on the soil it's in and how much uh, moisture is in the soil. And a cool EMS type is the live oak forest and woodland. This is an uncommon component and occurs on calcareous substrates which contain calcium carbonate which comes from limestone. This is that region, that little pink region we talked about earlier that is more reminiscent of the Edwards Plateau, which explains the live oaks presence. It's very interesting. Uh, the overstory is dominated by live oak and post oak and might also have post oak, uh, cedar elm, mesquite, and ash juniper making up uh, a more minor component. It is difficult to distinguish the uh, occurrence of light oak forests and woodlands in the Edwards, sorry, excuse me. Uh, it is difficult to distinguish these cross timbers, live oak forests and woodlands from those of the Edwards Plateau. All right, cross timbers and miscellaneous characteristics. The largest industries in the area are cattle and farming, which have impacted the landscape and species composi composition of different vegetation communities, as we have discussed. And some of the species of greatest conservation need that I thought were cool is yucca ne necopina, which is the, the Glen Rose yucca. It's only known in a few locations in north central Texas. It's endemic to Texas, actually. And one population may have unfortunately been destroyed. You can find it on sandy soils, on rolling grasslands that are usually shrub invaded in the Brazos River drainage. There isn't a ton of documentation about this species. And the rank of how endangered it is is high enough that it's not a huge conservation concern but it is a really cool species that is only found in texas another species of greatest conservation need found in the cross timbers is the brazos water snake nerodia harteri the population is endangered by deteriorating aquatic habitat conditions uh, also urban development degradation loss of habitat stream habitat Drought and dam construction and invasive fire ants have all been key players in population reduction. It occupies a small range uh, of rocky streams in the Brazos River drainage in central Texas. The habitat that it can be found in is fast flowing rocky streams that are free of dense vegetation along the water's edge. The next ecoregion we're going to discuss is the Central Great Plains. And you can see it's this little region that's between the Texas Blackland Prairie and the Southwestern Tablelands. Um, this region was once a grassland uh, with mixed and trans. Sorry, excuse me. <laughs> this ecological region was once grassland mainly and it was a, the grasslands were a mix uh, and transitional grassland between the tall grasses to the east in the Blackland Prairie and the short grasses in the west or the high plains of Texas. Uh, and it was scattered with low trees and shrubs that occur in the south. Now most of the region is cropland, unfortunately. <laughs> There's a common theme through all of this. I, I hope this isn't bringing you guys down too much. The abiotic characteristics of the region, uh, it has pretty uh, moderate uh, precipitation, similar to the cross timbers. It gets about 20 to 32 inches of rain per year. Uh, with more rain coming on the east side and decreasing as you move west. The mean temperatures range from 82 degrees Fahrenheit to 83.2 degrees Fahrenheit. The topography of the area is level to rolling and elevations range from 250 to 2,950 feet above sea level. 
Uh, I was kind of shocked by that higher end range of elevation. I don't know if that stuck out to anybody else, but I did some investigating because I thought some of you guys might have questions. And that higher elevation is a very, very tiny little portion of the uh, eco region that is located in that panhandle region. Uh, way, way, way up north. It, uh, it, it, it's like a little part of some really high elevation canyon land that is more a part of the southwestern tablelands and in the central Great Plains. It's just how the lines are drawn. So, in general, the elevation is, pretty, is well below 2,950 feet above sea level. The soils of the area are generally deep with shallow soils on ridges and breaks. Much of the region has reddish brown soils with high clay and sand content. So, um, the ecoregion generally has grasslands throughout that transition, like I said, from the tall grass in the east in the Blackland Prairie to the short grass of the west in the high plains. Most of the eco region is unfortunately now cropland. Uh, the non agricultural landscape is dominated by short and mid grass prairies and dense mesquite groves. These mesquite groves are present due to fire suppression, intense grazing pressure, and 19th century cattle drives. They are mostly located near streams and floodplain areas within the central Great Plains. And I wanted to note before we get into the EMS types that uh, we have not yet updated the titles of the EMS types to reflect uh, the, um, the splitting of the rolling plains region. The southwestern tablelands and the central Great Plains are merged in a lot of maps to be called this bigger rolling plains region. And uh, we have not split up the EMS types to reflect that yet. So a lot of the titles of the EMS types are going to have that rolling plains title on it. One of the most common uh, EMS types in the area is again row crops. Super exciting. This is going to be. Uh, this is. I'm going to have to keep do this only one more time in an eco region. I know it's not super exciting, but it's important to note. Uh, another common uh, eco re or not eco region, e ecological mapping system is the Rolling Plains Mixed Grass Prairie. It's a common prairie type in the Rolling Plains and the Central Great Plains that ma is made of little blue stem, side oats grama, big blue stem, and a lot of other grass species. Short and in areas that are more heavily grazed, it, there are, are short grass species that are favored, like buffalo grass and blue grandma. Another common EMS type found in the area is the High Plains Mesquite Shrubland. And uh, these are found along long drainages and on floodplains. The mesquite is the dominant plant of the system, obviously, and it is thought to have expanded on the landscape due to land use. It is difficult to distinguish uh, where, or it's sorry, it's difficult to distinguish this high plains mesquite shrubland from where mesquite has become invasive. So this mesquite shrubland type is only mapped on bottomland soils and along drainages, but where uh, the mesquite shrublands are not on bottomland soils is considered a native invasive mesquite shrubland, which is basically where the mesquite has formed a monoculture that wouldn't be there otherwise. Um, other species present in these mesquite shrublands might, in these bottomland, specific bottomland mesquite shrublands include netleaf hackberry, soapberry, black willow, and others. A unique ecoregion in this area is uh, the rolling plains, grass breaks, grasslands. Um, this is really more common in the southwestern tablelands, which is the next ecoregion we're going to discuss, but it, it extends also into the western portion of the central Great Plains. So that's why we're, we're talking about it now. Uh, this system is related to the southwestern Great Plains Canyon system, but this system, this ecological mapping system group, the breaks, breaks grassland is not confined to canyons. Mid to short grass, uh, 
Mid, it is covered with mid to short grasses, such as purple three on side oats grandma and little blue stem. Miscellaneous characteristics. The biggest air, uh, exports of the area, as we discussed, are agriculture, but ranching and oil production are also important industries in the area that have their impacts on the environment. Species of greatest conservation need include Texas poppy mallow, Calaro scab, sorry, <laughs> scab rioscula. This Texas poppy mallow occurs in Coke, Mitchell, Runnels, and Scurry counties. It grows in grasslands and shrublands along terraces of the upper Colorado River in very deep sandy soils. Uh, the population is limited by its preference for these deep sandy soils because <laughs> otherwise the seeds stay very close to the parent. The seeds are also short lived and have low viability. So these things are not reproductive machines. They kind of suck at <laughs> spreading their seeds, so to speak. And if you can see in this photo, uh, this Texas poppy mallow looks very similar and it's also very closely related to a favorite wildflower, the wine cup. But if you're in an area and you're trying to figure out, oh my gosh, is this the uh, the endangered Texas poppy mallow or is this just a wine cup to help you guys out, and uh, the, uh, the wine cup has more trailing stems while the Texas poppy mallow has erect stems. So um, also the uh, Texas poppy mallow is taller than the wine cup. Another uh, species of greatest conservation need in the Central Great Plains is the Texas kangaroo wrap, uh, Dipodomus elater. I hope I pronounced that right. This is um, a fairly large four-toed rat that has this white fluff on the tip of its tail. Its preferred habitat is clay soils uh, uh, with sparse grass cover and scattered mesquite bushes. They live in underground dens, um, and these underground dens open up at the base of or at the base of or the roots of small mesquite trees. They are nocturnal, so they only come out at night when it is completely dark, making them kind of hard to keep track of and have population counts of. Um, interestingly for this species, the domestic crops like oats and introduced grasses like Johnson grass are important for their diet. So this is a really rare example of where these invasive grasses uh, have helped a conservation issue. This is like so surprising. <laughs> the average litter size is three and they breed year round with peaks in early spring and late summer. Population threats come from the loss of burrowing habitat and genetic isolation of populations as native rangeland is converted to agricultural cropland. Now we're going to discuss the southwestern tablelands region. It's a really, really beautiful landscape. I have not been here personally, but I've seen photos and I mean, it's just so surprising. We don't really think of the um, panhandle of Texas as having anything remarkable or pretty. I feel like any Texan who talks about the panhandle does it in a very uh, gross way. <laughs> Uh, a beautiful land, it's a, it has these red-hued canyons, mesas, badlands, heavily eroded area, which are heavily eroded areas that have little vegetation and also has lots of river breaks. There's much less cropland, very refreshingly, uh, than the surrounding ecoregions and filled with subhumid grasslands and semi-arid rangelands. The abiotic characteristics, it is getting much, much drier for precipitation, uh, low rainfall and extreme temperatures. Precipitation ranges from 16 to 25 inches per year, which is far lower than the surrounding regions that we've been going over. Precipitation, or sorry, average uh, annual temperature ranges from 36.88 degrees Fahrenheit to 80.25. Uh, degrees Fahrenheit, so a, a pretty extreme temperature range. And the topography 
is very variable, which I'm sure you gathered from the last photos. Uh, there are tablelands with red-hued canyons, mesas, badlands, gorges, and river breaks. The low flats of this landscape are often cultivated, but for the most part, yeah, like uh, agriculture doesn't make a, a huge appearance in this area. And elevations range from 1,250 to 4,300 feet above sea level. So lots of range in um, the landscape. The soil is also very variable. Upland soils are neutral to alkaline sandy loams, clay loams and clays, and some deep sands as well. So just all over the board. <laughs> Bottomlands are reddish brown sandy to clayey soils with some saline areas. So a ton of variation in soils, which also means a variation in vegetation. There are a lot of plant communities in the southwestern tablelands, including short to midgrass prairies, pocket tall grass prairies, midgrass prairies with shinnery oak brush, mesquite savanna, shrublands, wooded swales and rough breaks and riparian areas with plains cottonwood just all over the board a common ems type is the rolling plains breaks deciduous shrubland which uh this ems type uh overlaps the southwestern great plains canyon system and uh, but the the breaks deciduous shrubland is not confined to the canyons they can occur on slopes and continue to nearby level uh, level sites upslope and downslope shrub species that can be found here include red cedar redberry cedar ash juniper mesquite broom snakeweed and many others Another common EMS type found in the area is the riparian deciduous shrubland and other variations of riparian vegetation types. Uh, the riparian deciduous shrubland is the primary vegetation type that is found in the riparian areas of the southwestern tablelands, but other variations of riparian vegetation groups include riparian hardwood forests, riparian juniper shrublands, um and many others that are also quite common this uh these deciduous shrublands specifically though occur adjacent to moisture rich areas usually along drainages and have more upland soils they are dominated by deciduous shrub species like mesquite and potentially hackberry black willow eastern cottonwood and others another common ems type is the rolling plains mixed grass prairie which we talked about on a previous slide, but it's dominated by little blue stem, winter grass, side oats, grama, and other grasses. Some cool EMS types include the sandy shinnery shrubland, which is located on rolling to level uplands with sandy soils, but not on deep sands or sand hills. So it's sandy, but not too sandy. Uh, shrub cover is variable, but Havard's shin oak is the dominant uh, shrub species. And another cool EMS type is Brakes Canyon, uh, Rolling Plains Brakes Canyon. This is not super rare again, but it's part of this southwestern Great Plains Canyon system. They lack significant vegetation cover, but they serve as a huge nature attraction for people to see. I love looking at canyons. There is just so much to look at. It's just this beautiful scene. I think they're fun no matter where they are. So miscellaneous characteristics of the Southwest Tablelands, the exports of the area um, are mostly ranching and oil and gas production because there is a pretty small amount of urban development in the area. Um, some cool uh, species of greatest conservation need include the Cori's Evening Primrose, Oenothera corii. Uh, this is a this uh, primrose is vulnerable and endemic to Texas. It's reported from grasslands in eight counties in the southwestern tablelands and central Great Plains of northwest Texas. The optimal habitat is sparsely vegetated areas with grasslands on canyon breaks usually, as well as some disturbed sites, and 
the threat of this population, the specific threat of this population um, has not been identified, but it is thought that grazing is a threat to this species. Another species of greatest conservation need is the Texas horned lizard. The population of this lizard is doing pretty well in other areas within its range, but in Texas, uh, it is considered vulnerable. Um, the threats to the population come from fire ants, insecticides, habitat loss, and over collection for uh, being a pet. Ideal habitat is open arid and semi-arid regions with sparse vegetation, so like foothills and prairies. Uh, the, the areas might have light cover of grass, cacti, or scattered brush and scrubby trees. Uh, when inactive, the lizard burrows into the soil and enters rodent burrows or hides under rocks. So uh, having sand that you can get into or soils that you can get into is important. And I wanted to make a note again that the Central Great Plains are combined with the Southwestern Tablelands uh, to form the overall Rolling Plains region in the Natural Regions map for the TMN recertification pen. So I went and separated them for this um, presentation, but uh, they are often combined. But now you can, you can distinguish the Eastern and Western regions. Next, we're going to discuss the High Plains. This is the southern extension of the Great Plains, which includes similar areas in Oklahoma and New Mexico. The High Plains region is super cool. It uh, has thousands of playa lakes that dot the landscape that are essential for waterfowl during their migration. Playas are shallow. Also, for anyone who doesn't know, playas are, playas are shallow circular shaped wetlands that are filled by rainfall and they are a significant feature recharge feature of the Ogallala aquifer that supplies water to a lot of the residents within the um, high plains panhandle region the landscape has a high percentage of cropland now but some remnant short grass prairies remain and there are also some shrublands to the south but a lot of it is agriculture the abiotic conditions of the High Plains has pretty low uh, precipitation in comparison to the rest of Texas. Rainfall is lowest in oops, rainfall is lowest in the winters and midsummer, and highest in April or May and September or October. It has extended droughts in history, and the average annual precipitation is quite low, with only 15 to 22 inches. Average annual temperatures range from 37.1 to 78.8 degrees Fahrenheit, so also a huge uh, uh, range in temperature. For the topography in the area, the High Plains region, as indicated by the name, occurs on a high plateau of more than 19.4 million acres. The landscape is flat and has lots of playas scattered throughout 19,000 was the number that I got which is crazy that is so many <laughs> several rivers originate in the high plains that uh, originate in the high plains or cross the area and elevations range from 2,380 to 4,735 4, feet above sea level soils are somewhat productive and the flat surface surface encourages irrigation and mechanization which supports the ranching and agriculture industry in uh, the high plains upland soils are alkaline clay loams and sandy loams in, sh in shades of brown or red sandy soils are more present in the southern part of the region as you get closer to the uh, edwards plateau and trans pecos region there aren't a lot of bottomland soils in this region, but caliche generally underlies these surface soils. For the vegetation in the area, the natural vegetation is primarily short grass prairies and uh, trans pecos shrubs are in the south and tall grass prairies exist in the east. The influence of agriculture, though, has really, really impacted the landscape. 
Um, a really common EMS type, again, this is the last time I'm going to do this to you guys, is row crops. As you can see from this map, it's quite heavily present in the uh, High Plains region, so I had to mention it. Another really common uh, EMS type is the High Plains short grass prairie, which is found on level to rolling uplands. Buffalo grass and blue grama are the dominant short grasses that are present. Other species that can exist in the high plains short grass prairies are purple three on, side oats grandma, and hairy grandma, um, but they will usually be present at lower capacities than buffalo grass or blue grandma. The species composition will also vary depending on how intensely grazed that plain is. Another common uh, EMS type is the high plains playa grassland. So going back to the playas that dot the landscape, um, playa the grasslands occur in the areas around playa lakes that are dominated by herbaceous species and they typically occur in the drier portions of the playa around it or if playas haven't had water inundated in them for an extended period of time the herbaceous plants will start to encroach into the playa the depression in the ground uh, this area is dominated by herbaceous species such as western wheatgrass, buffalo grass, common frog fruit, Pennsylvania smartweed, and others. Now, a cool EMS type is the High Plains Salt Lake. As previously discussed, there are several playas along the landscape. Well, some, there are also salt lakes, which is super cool. Saline lakes and salty bottomlands often have salt encrusted surfaces and are uh, often sparsely vegetated. Some of these lakes were thought to form from wind erosion and or the, the surface level of soil being dissolved. Uh, dominant plants are often halophytic. Again, that means that they can grow in high salinity areas. Uh, those include saltgrass, pickleweed, alkali saccaton, and other species. Another cool EMS type is active sand dunes. Um, I think that I think I mentioned earlier when we were still in the coast that I think sand dunes are super cool. They occur on deep sand sites in the high plains and sand hill sites with little vegetation. Sites nearby can have variable shrub cover, cover and low herbaceous cover, but in general, it's pretty much just like sandy hills, which is cool to see. Uh, outside of the coast, I think a lot of Texans would know that you can find these sand dunes in Texas. You either associate them with coastal areas or like the sand dunes in Air, uh, New Mexico and Arizona. All right, and now the miscellaneous characteristics of the High Plains. Exports, obviously, agriculture. Another big industry in the area is oil and gas as well as ranching. Species of greatest conservation need found in the High Plains include this is the first time I'm not including any plant species. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you guys saw that I do have a preference for plants. But uh, the first one we're going to discuss is the swift fox, Vulpes velox. The swift fox has disappeared from about 60% of its range. Um, it is still widespread in the U.S., but is critically imperiled in Texas specifically. Their range extends from the high plains of Texas to Canada, so they have a lot of room to support their population. Swift foxes live in open desert or grasslands. In Texas, they are they selected only short grass prairies and have lower than expected use for completely or have it completely avoided non-native grasslands. Irrigate, they have, sorry, they have uh, completely avoided non-native grasslands, irrigated agri agricultural fields, and dryland agricultural fields, because invaded grasslands aren't good enough for them. Um, I think that that's kind of funny that they are so picky. Threats are habitat loss and competition with red fox and coyote and vehicle collision. So watch where you're driving in the high plains. Another species of greatest conservation need in the high plains is the black-tailed prairie dog, Cynomus ludovicianus. Uh, this is vulnerable in Texas, but it the black-tailed prairie dog is vulnerable in Texas, but secure in other regions of the United States. The abundance of the black-tailed prairie dog has been reduced from historical levels by 98%, but 
um, the threat is still considered moderate. Prairie dogs are an important part of the prairie ecosystem and serve as a food source for many predators and leave their burrows vacant for different uh, species such as the burrowing owl, black-footed ferret, Texas horned lizard, and other animals. For some fun facts, since it's Valentine's Day, these are kind of sweet. Uh, prairie dogs are social animals and they live in what are called prairie dog towns. How cute is that? And then the towns are further subdivided into wards and wards are subdivided into distinct social units called coteries. So that's kind of like a family unit. And among these family members, <laughs> I love this. Prairie dogs will greet each other with bared teeth, which they kiss with to show that they recognize each other. Aw, like that's so cute. They love each other, right? Pref the preferred habitat for these black-tailed prairie dogs is a uh, short grass prairie, which we've discussed is readily prevalent in the High Plains region. Um, it doesn't like heavy brush or tall grass because it reduces the visibility. Ranching and farming are put, have pushed prairie dogs out of their native habitat and have contributed to the reduction in range and population. Um, next eco region is the Chihuahua Desert. Home stretch, you guys. We're almost there. Uh, this is also referred to as the Trans-Pecos region. This desert ecoregion extends from southeastern Arizona into the Edwards Plateau. This is the northernmost portion of the southernmost desert in North America, which extends from uh, more than 500 miles into Mexico. Um, you, so that, that was a mouthful, but basically this is the northernmost uh, portion of a desert that goes south. I hope that makes sense. So just absolutely beautiful landscape. This region is mountain ranges, major river drainages, grasslands, shrublands, and so many different types of habitats. This arid, arid region is mostly used as rangeland and some of the fertile soils around the Rio Grande and uh, Pecos River are being used for cropland, but not much. Uh, for the climate, obviously, it's very dry. It's as west as it gets in the uh, in Texas. So rainfall varies greatly from year to year, and it varies a lot from higher to lower elevations, which you can see in this precipitation map. It um, has a bunch of different colors in this region, indicating that there are lots of levels and degrees of rainfall. July and August have higher rainfall generally, and average rainfall ranges from 8 to 26 inches per year. So again, huge variation. Average temperatures range from 43.8 degrees Fahrenheit to 78.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And I thought that the high end of that range would be a bit higher, to be completely honest. So that was a little surprising. Um, so for the topography of the area, you can't describe it in words. This has such a diverse topography from desert valleys to mountains. It, uh, it, is, it is extremely, extremely variable. And you can see that in the elevation range. It goes from 1,200 to 8,378 feet below sea level. Truly magnificent. Uh, the soil in the area is generally alkaline. Upland soils are clay loams, clays, and sands. Many areas have deep sands as well. Bottomland soils are usually dark silt loams, loams, clay loams, and clays. Uh, and when it comes to soil management, issues will come from the lack of soil moisture as well as wind erosion. Um, next, moving on to vegetation. Due to the diversity of soils and elevations and precipitation, lots of vegetation types exist. The principal plant communities are creosote, tar bush, desert scrub, desert grassland, yucca and juniper savannas, and mountain forests. Common EMS types, a really common EMS type is the Trans-Pecos Loamy Plains grassland. This community occurs in level intermountain basins with deep soils. Different grassland EMS types are present when you get into rolling plains and shallow soils, so um, this Again, location is really important. 
when we talk about classifying EMS types. From the name of this one, you can gather that it's on loamy soils. These grasslands are dominated by blue grama, side oats grama, burrow grass, and many other species. And mesquite is a common invader to this area. Transpecos creosote scrub is another common EMS type found in the area. Systems, this system generally occurs on rolling landforms and it occupies outwash, outwash plains and basins between mountains. The soil is typically quite gravelly in these areas. Creosote brush is clearly the dominant shrub of the system per the name. Other species might make their presence such as tar bush, white thorn acacia, and mesquite, but they are usually present at lower uh, quantities than the uh, creosote brush. Next, another common landscape is, or EMS type is the lower montane riparian shrublands. This system is found in valleys, drainages, and canyons of lower mountain slopes and foothills. The shrubland, these shrublands follow perennial and seasonally intermittent streams. The woody species in the system include seep willow, southwestern black willow, cat claw mimosa, button bush, and other more moisture loving species because, as the name indicates, this is a riparian area. Moving on to cool and unique, fun EMS types, we have the Transpecos Desert Synagogue Marsh. This one is super cool. This is a herbaceous system occurring in drainages fed by freshwater springs. I always think that oasis type environments are super, super interesting. Uh, how like that, that, that there's just these lush landscapes in the middle of deserts. Uh, the composition of the system depends on the depth and availability of water from the spring. The common plants found include, unfortunately, Bermuda grass again and uh, different rushes. Sometimes the evaporative process will also make the conditions more saline and you'll get more halophytic plants like alkali sacaton, uh, salt grass, and other different salt tolerant plants. Another cool unique EMS type is the Transpecos Desert Volcanic Rockland. Kind of feels otherworldly to me. These are sparsely vegetated on rocky or boulder filled slopes. These rocks come from a volcanic origin, and species found will include creosote brush, ocotillo, and um, mesquite might be present. Concentration this, this EMS type is concentrated around the Big Bend area, which is kind of a window into the past with uh, volcanoes in Texas. Very cool. Um, and the last, uh, the miscellaneous characteristics of the Transpecos region. Oil and gas protection and ranching are the biggest industries in the region. Some agriculture exists, but it's limited due to low water supply. Some species of greatest conservation need include Nelly Cori Cractus or Escobaria minima. This is a critically imperiled uh, cactus in Texas. It is the smallest uh, cactus in North America and it is only found in Texas. And also to add to that, it's only found in a small area of Brewster County in the Transpecos region. So the spines of this cactus are stout, blunt, and almost peg-like. They are so numerous that you can barely see the stem. It prefers the habitat uh, the preferred habitat is exposed areas of flint-like rock in the full sun, and sometimes it will occur on spike moss mats in the Chihuahua Desert uh, shrublands. Population threats uh, come from cactus collectors. Just get more common cactuses, guys. Uh, another cool SGCN species is the Comanche Springs pupfish, Cypri Cyprinodon elegans, it is considered critically imperiled in Texas. It only occurs in Texas and only exists in just a few strings. It is adapted to fret, uh, harsh desert conditions and it can tolerate a range of temperatures and salinities. It prefers freshwater springs with marshes and canals. And the biggest threats to the species come from the declined spring flow and reduced surface water. Uh, also, it hybridizes with other fish and exotic species will encroach and compete with the uh, Comanche Springs pubfish, thus causing more population decline. 
last eco region, and we're going to be very brief with this one. This is the Arizona New Mexico Mountains. It makes up a very small portion of um, the state. As you can see, we had to even zoom in on it so you could see the outline. Um, it is pretty much just the Davis Mountains region of Texas. Um, it, it extends into other states, but as for Texas, it's just the David, uh, Davis Mountains. It, and typically, when it's discussed in um, uh, these, or, excuse me, <laughs> I need to get a drink of water. Typically, when it's discussed among scientists, it is grouped with the whole Trans-Pecos region. So no one really takes the time to say this is the Arizona, New Mexico mountains. Um, and we will discuss the distinguishing characteristics. The climate in the area has slightly higher precipitation than the rest of the Trans-Pecos region. And um, that could be due to the climate or the, sorry, the precipitation being measured in such a small region in comparison to the average of the Trans-Pecos region. And um, I'm, not, I'm not sure what the precipitation of this whole New Mexico, Arizona mountains looks like, but as for what we get in Texas, uh, this tiny little portion, it gets a little bit higher precipitation than Trans-Pecos on average. As for the uh, ecoregion's vegetation, Chaparrals are common at lower elevations. You'll see pinyon, pine, juniper, and oak woodlands at lower and middle elevations on, uh, in this ecoregion. And at higher elevations, you can find ponderosa pine forests. My old boss actually researched these, so shout out to Liz. <laughs> um, and the, uh, one of the species of uh, greatest conservation need is Arenaria livermorensis or livermore sandwort, not the prettiest name. Um, oh, sorry, I meant to show you guys these uh, pictures of the vegetation. Um, this is Arenaria livermorensis. And I want to note that this picture on the right is uh, not Arianaria livermorensis. I could not find a live photo of it. This is just a different Arianaria species. I wanted to give you guys uh, some kind of idea of what it might look like alive uh, because the uh, herbarium photo that you see off to the left is not super informative or descriptive, right? Um, it's critically imperiled and endemic in Texas. It is known from a single occurrence in the Davis Mountains on high elevation rock walls with sparse vegetation. Livermore soundwort is a moss-like perennial herb and more research really needs to be done for us to have an idea of the population size and trends of the species. The primary threat is climate change and recreation. Um, and that is it, so you are ecoregion experts now. You guys know everything there is to know about Texas. Hopefully uh, I covered everything enough to where you guys know where you're at and what's around you and where you want to go, the next park you want to go. You want to know all that you know about that ecoregion. And this is um, a resource for further explore exploration. Anyone who is really interested in the EMS types that we were explaining and what the landscape ecology team does, this is this really cool app called team some of you might have gotten training from it but it stands for texas ecosystem analytical mapper which allows you to explore the different ems types across the state you can generate reports for areas of interest and it connects you to links on our website to learn more about the ecological mapping systems of texas we don't have time i've already gone so far over to go through an example, but it's super useful and I encourage you guys to go to this link and explore it. Laura, Thanks for coming. <laughs> thank you, Laura. And you deserve a lunch break. And, <laughs> um, and I want to let you know, 
Wendy, super Wendy jumped on and was answering questions. Like, uh, really, I think she answered all that helped answer all the questions. So she's, um, uh, she's, she's yeah. my hero. She's so great. <laughs> well, you both are my hero. So <laughs> great presentation today. Excellent awesome. information. Thank um, you. I'm going to send you some quotes afterwards, but just everybody loved it as in awe of you and your talent and your information. Um, and we just can't thank you enough for everything. Awesome. Today. I'm so glad that you guys enjoyed. It was awesome to make myself appreciate Texas even more than I already did. So this is really fun. I appreciate this opportunity. Well, go um, get a drink. I will. Go <laughs> take a nap. <laughs> I think I will. I think I will. Thank you guys. Oh, thank you thank so much, you. Laura. And. Uh, a lot of folks were talking about so much information and wanting to watch the recording. So we dropped the link again for the recording. Oh.